I want us to go to the Word. And we are talking about serving God in the workplace. Serving God in the workplace. We are reading from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5, all the way to verse 9, and we shall read Colossians chapter 3, verse 22, all the way to chapter 4, verse 1. Let's begin with Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5. Bond servants... Be obedient to those who are your masters, according to the flesh. Let me read that again. Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in sincerity of heart, as to Christ, not with eye service, as men, as men pleases, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Verse 7, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. Verse 9 relates to masters. And it says, and masters do the same things to them, giving them, giving up threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven and there is no partiality in him. Colossians chapter 3 verse 22. Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men please us, but in sincerity of heart fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. And then chapter 4, verse 1, Masters, give your bond servants what is just and fair, knowing that you have a master in heaven. The workplace that was anticipated by Paul when he was writing these two portions of scripture, or the kind of a relationship that he was looking at, was a relationship of a master and a slave. That is why he was writing to bond servants. And bond servants were slaves that were working without pay. In today's world, we do not have slavery, and in parts of the world where slavery still exists, it is condemned. It is against the human rights. So, when we are looking at this portion of scripture, we have in mind that we are not talking of slavery, and neither are we advocating for slavery. But the relationship that existed then between masters and slaves is the same concepts that exist today between an employer and an employee. Because when you are employed or when you go out seeking employment, you sell your mind, you sell your time to that particular person to serve him under his rules for a particular period of time. And if you are found serving another master, you could be disciplined, you could be sacked. So you still sell your time and you sell your body and mind to think in line with the principles that promote what you have been employed to do. You give your time, you give your body and your employment period, if it is between the year of 25 all the way to 60, that period of time you have given it for service to someone else and they pay you and you become their servant although paid. The workplace today would refer to formal employment where you are in a formal office working with a formal pay, probably in a structured kind of a system. 
or even an informal kind of work where you work as a casual laborer, you work today, tomorrow you're working for a different employee. It could be voluntary pay, voluntary employment where you're giving your services for no pay as a volunteer. It could also be paid where you have to earn at the end of the month. So when I'm talking about the workplace, I'm talking about all these kind of places where you are working either voluntarily or for a pay, formally or informally. That is the workplace that we are talking about. It could be in church, it could be in ministry, it could be a self-service that you've given, a service that you've given. All this is a, is a form of workplace that I want us to talk to you about. The topic is service of God in the workplace. So the first question we ask is what is service? And the online dictionary describes or defines service as helping someone or doing work for someone. That brings in now the two categories. Helping someone where you are doing it voluntarily, perhaps without any pay, or doing work for someone where you're getting paid. Now we are talking about serving God in the workplace. We all know that God is not in the workplace. Our boss, the one that employs you, is a human being. You get paid and you're in a salary and a payroll of a human being. So how do we serve God in the workplace? Yet we are supposed to serve our masters. Now, God does not need any help because service is helping or doing work for someone. God does not need any help. He is an omnipotent God. He is able to do every, everything for himself. He has created the whole world without help from anyone. He does not need your assistance to do anything. He can do it. He is able. He does not need any form of help. So how do we end up then helping God or serving God in the workplace? Colossians, where we've read, and Philippians, gives us three things that I want us to look at. And before I go to the three things, I need to say, that in Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, all the way to 46, the story is given of how God, when, when he shall come on his throne, and he shall separate the goats and the sheep, and he shall say, to the left are the sheep, and to the right are the goats, and he will say, uh, go to hell and go into my eternal kingdom. And the reason he shall separate them like that is because he shall say, I came to you, I was in prison, you never came to see me. I needed something to wear, you never gave me. I was hungry, you never fed me. And all these people shall ask, when did you do this? And he shall reply that when you visited whoever the least of this, when you visited them in prison, in hospital, and you gave them food to eat, when you clothed them, you were doing it to me. So, whenever we do anything to anyone, we are indeed serving God. Whether our neighbors, whether the employer or the employee, and we shall come to this in this part of the scripture, that whatever we do in our workplace, we should have an attitude that we are doing it to the Lord. There is work that you can do and you get paid. And what you have been paid by your employer is all there is for you to ever have. It is all the payment that there is. But there is an attitude you can adopt. And you do service to your employer. And even after being paid by your employer, it is not yet enough compared to what has been stored up for you. There is a way you can serve God. There is a way you can do your work. And all you get as your pay, as your salary, is all there is for your recompense. And there is another way you can do your work. And you get paid. But whatever you have been paid is nothing compared to what the Lord is still to pay you. 
It is not enough to pay you. And that is what I want us to talk about today. Serving God such that you serve God with an eternal reward. Serving God, not looking at the money that you will get at the end of the month, but serving God with the eternal reward in mind. Serving God, not looking. And Jesus even told, his, um, when he was teaching in Matthew chapter 6, he said, when you do charitable things, don't, don't blow your trumpet. Because when you do that and you get the applause of people, you get your reward. What this means is, there is a way you can still help people, there is a way you can still serve people, and you have a reward here on earth, and an eternal reward yet to come. Employees, let's begin there today. And on Wednesday, we shall talk about the employers. Today we talk about the employees. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 5 to 8. And Colossians chapter 3 verse 22 to 25. In these two portions of scripture we find that there is something that needs to be done by the employee. There is something to be done. Number two, there is an attitude of doing it. And number three, there is an awareness of a fundamental principle that will keep the relationship going. What is it that needs to be done, number one? What is to be done? The Bible says, bond servants, obey. What needs to be done by any employee, any worker, is simply obedience. And what is to obey? To obey is simply to follow orders. To do as you are told. To follow directives. And in Colossians, in what things? In all things. So you cannot choose to obey in one area and not in another. You obey in all things. What is to be done? Obedience. Where and how? In all things. Number two. What is the attitude of obeying? How do we obey? Philippians, Ephesians chapter 6. Obey your masters with fear and trembling. And number two, with sincerity of heart. Fear and trembling does not mean that you shudder at your boss. Whenever he appears, you become weak and timid. It does not mean that you become a weakling. It does not mean that you become a puppet. Fear and trembling does not relate to the boss in this scripture. I want to bring it home. Fear and trembling and sincerity of heart has been, give, has been likened to something so that we may understand how we need to fear and tremble and how we need to have sincerity of heart. The Bible says, Obey with fear and trembling and sincerity of heart as to Christ. In the same way you would fear and obey Christ. In the same way you would be sincere towards Christ. That is the sincerity and the fear and the trembling that we are to apply. Why? Because the Bible is saying that the, both the servant and the master have another master in heaven. Both of them have a master. So as an employee, if you would not do certain things to Christ and you are told to do them, then the fear and the trembling is towards Christ, in knowing that how can I do such a thing to God? And Joseph asked the wife of Potiphar, how can I do such an evil thing to my God? This was an employer and an employee. He is given a direct order to obey, but his fear and trembling is turned towards God. And he says, not to you, but to my God. 
so that whatever we do and whatever orders we have to execute we have to look at them against the will of god so that if it is not in line with the will of God, we work our salvation with fear and trembling because we know we can lose our standing with Christ. We know that we can lose the grace that we continue to operate and to receive in Christ. And so the fear and the trembling goes towards Christ. Hallelujah. Fear and trembling not towards bosses not to be foolish and to obey things in whichever way you are told but to be careful about your relationship with christ christ would not ask you to do ungodly and execute evil orders if you would not do it for christ don't do it for your boss. And this is not calling upon rebellion. It is calling upon you to explain yourself. To keep your faith and your conscience towards God clean. And you must have them, your bosses, your employers, understand that this is against your conscience. The sincerity of heart, sincerity means with no hidden agenda, with no hidden motive. This means that you should not obey your bosses or your employers simply because there is a hidden motive, there is an agenda you want to achieve. There is something you want to get out of them. You are trapping them because this is very common today. You please, you obey, looking out for something. Wanting to trap the, 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 your bosses and your employers. Self-seeking. Looking out for your own good. No sincerity of heart. You are doing something so that you may gain something. You want to gain an unfair advantage over your colleagues. And the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 verse 3, Let nothing be done for selfish ambition or conceit. Do nothing for selfish ambition or conceit. Udanganyifu. Wanting to get an unfair advantage. That is one of the ways that we are going to obey. With fear and trembling. With sincerity of heart. And here we are looking at the motive. What is your motive? And remember God looks at your motive. God looks at the heart. Not how you do and what you do. And how good you look after you do it. But what was the motive of you doing it? Let it not be for selfish ambition. And verse 3, the number, number 3 thing. You obey with fear and trembling, looking at Christ. Number 2, with sincerity of heart. Number 4, number 3, not with eye service. Not with eye service as men please us. This means that your obedience should not be done to please men. It should not be done just to please men. It says, not as men please us, but as born servants of God, doing the will of God. So that you cannot be pleasing men at the expense of Christ. You cannot be pleasing men at the, uh, at the expense of the will of God. You cannot be a man pleaser or a man pleaser. And the kingdom of God suffers. When you are given orders to execute. And the will of God is placed on the balance. If the will of God tips over the order, then you do the will of God. And this does not mean that you should go 
resigning over every ungodly order that you get. It does not mean that you go giving up your jobs because your bosses are ungodly. Or you go, you know, bringing strife and acrimony. You have been given wisdom to apply. You know that you are a Christian and you have made yourself known that you are a Christian. Make it known that there are things you will not do and they will not ask you to do them. The problem is that we become complacent and we do them for a while and after some time we want to stop doing them. We have already given the leeway. If you are a person who cannot work on a Saturday because it is your Sabbath day or you cannot work on Sunday because it's your, it is your day of worship, make it known. So that these requests do not come. But when you have condoned them, it becomes very difficult. If you cannot execute illegal orders, let it be known from the word go. If you cannot take a bribe, let it be known from the word go. But don't take the bribe and then tomorrow come tell us you're a Christian. Let it be known from the word go, I cannot do this. Make your, bond, make your boundaries known in advance. Execute the will of God. Don't please men. Even if it is the most convenient thing to do. If it is against the will of God. Sorry, please don't do it. This is the attitude of putting the will of God before the orders that you must execute. Ungodly orders stand no chance of being obeyed in the face of the will of God. But as I said, keep doing the will of God. Don't compromise it. Because the moment you compromise it, you put yourself in a precarious situation. How are you going to tell us you can't do this and you did it yesterday? Don't do it from the word go. And keep on to that. Number six, number four. Remember we are talking of how you should obey, the attitude of obedience. We have said number one is with fear and trembling as to Christ. Number two, with sincerity of heart. Number three, not with eye service or as men pleasers, but as born servants doing the will of God. Number six, number four, with good will. It says there, number verse 7, with good will doing service to the Lord. What is good will? Good will is being friendly, helpful, cooperative, it's an attitude of wanting the good in others to excel. It's the opposite of malice. It's the opposite of self-seeking. It's the opposite of trodding on others. It's the opposite of every good thing that you can, it's every good relationship that you can have with people. You have goodwill, you are friendly. You want others to prosper, you want others to excel. You are helpful. You can show them you are going to fail if you apply this strategy. Use this other one. You want them to succeed as you also succeed. It's goodwill. Don't do anything. Looking out for the downfall of your master. Don't do anything looking out for the downfall of your colleagues. Don't do anything looking out for the downfall of your employee, of your, of your business. This is how they have decided to treat us. This is how we will treat them. We will make sure this never succeeds. That is not goodwill. This is how the bosses have decided we are going to do this and you are going to make sure that this plan will never succeed. This play, this project must fail. This must fail. You know, that is not goodwill. My colleagues, your colleagues have done something to you. Because they are, they are ungodly and they are self-seeking. They have done things that have offended you. And then you go and say, I will also do the same to them. I will make sure they fail. They wanted me to fail. Now it is their time to fail. 
that is not good will. Philippians chapter 2 verse 4 the Bible says, Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. In this verse, it acknowledges that you should look out for your interests. It says, let each one not look out, look out not only for his own interests. So, it's good to look out for your interests. But even as you look out for your interests, look out for the interests of others. Don't be too shrouded in the pursuit of your promotion and you start trodding on other people's possibilities of promotions and opportunities. Don't be too shrouded in the desire and the pursuit for riches and happiness. You start sinking other people's boats. Do whatever it takes to keep your boat afloat. But don't sink the boat of your neighbor. Do whatever it is that you need to do to keep your boat afloat. But don't sink my boat. That is not goodwill. You want to earn a living? Earn it. I too need to earn a living. Don't earn a living at my expense. If I am fired, you are not going to get my salary. You will still get your salary. So please, earn your salary. Let me earn mine too. You have children to feed. You have loans to pay and bills to pay. I too have the same. Please, let us all feed our families. That is not the situation that we see today. We sink every other person's boat so that we can remain afloat. And that is not the attitude, the biblical attitude that we are being given here today. Number five. Obey joyfully. Colossians chapter 3 verse 23. In all you do, do it joyfully. Do it heartily. Do it with joy. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14 to 15. Do all things without complaining and disputing. That you may become blameless and harmless. Children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Among whom you shine as lights in the world. We are told that we are light bearers. We shine as lights in the world. As Christian, as employees, Christian employees, we shine a light in our workplaces. For us to be that light, for us to show that light, for us to be blameless and without fault in the midst of ungodly colleagues that we work with, in the midst of a perverse and a crooked generation, for us to be different in how we execute our work, for her to be different in how we execute the orders that we are given, we must do all things without complaining and without disputing. We must give our best and execute our orders with joy. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 47 and 48. I will read that one. Deuteronomy 28, 47 to 48. Because you did not serve the Lord, your God, with joy and gladness of heart. For the abundance of everything. Because you did not serve God, your, the Lord, your God, with joy and gladness of heart for the abundance of everything. Therefore, verse 48. You shall serve your enemies, whom the Lord will send against you, in hunger, in thirst, in nakedness, and in need of everything. And he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. 
failing to serve God, and we have said that we serve our masters as though we are serving God. It is God that we serve through our masters. Failing to serve them with joy causes God to repel, to repel us. He has blessed us with work. He has given us an abundance in everything. You are earning your living. You are making your money. You are taking care of your bills. You are surviving. You are living your life. But you don't serve with joy. You don't look at that job as a blessing from the Lord, as a source of supply. You don't look at it as a form of blessing, as an opportunity that God has given you to bless you. So you start complaining and you start grumbling and you start complaining against everybody and everything in your workplace because you don't serve him with joy. He will cause you to serve your enemies. That's how you lose your job. That's how you lose opportunities. That's how you lose everything. What God has given you as a blessing becomes a curse. Becomes a thing of murmuring and complaining. God will take it away. The Bible says that his blessings make rich and they add no sorrow. So if the blessing of a job has now become a sorrow to you, he will take it away. Because he has to be true to his word that his blessing should not add sorrow. So if it has become a source of sorrow, he will as well take it away from you so that you can be happy. So let's stop complaining and murmuring. You may have any, whatever kind of a boss you may have, but please, take your job as an opportunity by God to bless you. He has put you there that you may be able to make wealth for your family. Take it as a blessing and a form of opportunity by which he will bless you. Number three, the third thing. Number one, what must be done? Obey. Obedience. Number two, how must it be done? What is the attitude of doing it? With fear and trembling, with sincerity of heart, not with eye service, with goodwill and joyfully. And then number three, what is the awareness of the fundamental principle that we must keep, that will keep our work, the employer-employee relationship going on? What is that awareness? What is the fundamental principle that we must always remember? Ephesians 6, 8 Three things. One, Ephesians 6, 8. Whatever good you do, you will receive from the Lord. You must always know the first thing. That whatever good you do, either to your colleagues, to your clients, to your employer, to the business as a whole, to the business community, whatever good you do, you will receive the same from the Lord. God is not a robber. He will not rob you of your goodwill. He will not cause you to do things and not pay you back. Whatever good you do, you will receive it. You may lack good things in your life simply because you don't do good. You need a promotion, it is a good thing. Are you doing good to earn the good? There is a dispute that you need the Lord to intervene for you. That could cost your job. There is conflict. You need the goodness of the Lord. Are you doing good? Because if you are not doing good, you don't deserve no good. Number two. You must remember. That you suffer hardship for the hardships you cause. Colossians 3.25 Colossians 3.25 says, And remember, knowing that he who does wrong 
will be repaid for what he has done and he has no partiality whatever wrong you do you will receive it whatever wrong you do for others for your colleagues whatever wrong you do behind the curtains when the boss is not looking how much time you waste when he's gone he leaves the office and you sit down and start wasting his time he's not in for this week and that is the week you also are not in whatever wrong you do you will receive it from the lord and the lord shows no partiality he will do it to you just like he has done it to others you are no special person he will do it whatever hardships you cause for people they will come to you whatever stumbling blocks you put on people's paths you will have the same stumbling blocks and they could come at a time when you really did not want them to be there number 3 number 3 the third thing the awareness that it is from the lord that you will receive your reward colossians 3:24 you must know that it is from the lord you will receive the reward of your inheritance you will get paid you will get your salary you will get your per diem you will get your allowances but that is not enough the lord still has a reward for your inheritance the lord still has a reward to pay you and the lord will pay you in many ways he will give you peace at home he will give you a stable family he will give you a stable set of children he will give you businesses that will thrive he will make your farms to produce he will give you peace in your marriage he will cause your children to excel and to prosper in life he will cause many things the way god can bless you is i mean it's enormous it cannot be explained he has his own diverse ways of paying you so you must work not only looking for the salary and the pay that you're going to get at the end of the month but looking forward for the reward from God the reward of an inheritance the reward from the Lord that is what you should work obedience pays i know many of us may have already messed up looking at what we are talking about probably we already see where we have gone wrong we can see that we have not worked with good will that we have repaid evil for evil and we have set stumbling blocks upon people's paths and we have made sure that they never progress because of what they did and what they said and we have made sure that because they put a stumbling block you are going to put a bigger one for them and you are digging pits for them then pitfalls and you are making all these things and you are not obedient you've been a man pleaser you've been obeying and pleasing men and not caring about the will of god we can already see where we have gone wrong this is your time to come back before it's too late it is your time to adopt the attitude the biblical attitude of the employer of the employee on wednesday we shall talk about the biblical attitude of the employer then we shall finish with this series this short series of serving god in the workplace i want to pray for you let us pray lord we thank you for your word and your reminder that we need to obey in our workplace and not just obey but obey in fear and trembling and in sincerity of heart looking towards you looking to do your will that we should oh god work not as men pleasers but as your pleasers doing your will oh god and i know that lord there are many people with this challenge 
that they are caught up in situations where they don't know what to obey. And they are fearing of losing their jobs and their opportunities. Because if they obey you, they are going to suffer consequences. If they obey you, there are consequences that are going to come to them. May you strengthen them, O oh God. You have asked us in your word to do your will. And your will cannot be supplemented by anything. It cannot be exchanged with anything. Your will, O oh God. I pray that in Jesus' name you may help all the people that are hearing to be able to do your will. And I ask you, O oh God, that you may also rescue them from situations where they have to be in hard places to choose between you and their bosses and the nature of instructions they have to go. I pray that you may reach out to those workplaces, O oh God, and change that environment and change their hearts of everybody so that they may be able to execute and to give directives of orders that are godly in the name of Jesus. Lord, some people need strength because they have been too complacent and now they need to start afresh and they need to start rejecting some of the things they have been complacent with. Some of the things that they, they have been doing now they need to stop doing. Give them a firmness of heart. Give them a firmness in their faith. Let them stand firm. Being strong. Resisting the enemy. Give them a firm faith in the name of Jesus. Lord, give everyone the ability to work in goodwill. And to serve joyfully. In the awareness, oh God, that you are going to repay every good. And every hard, bad thing that you do, you are also going to repay. But most importantly, oh God, that you are going to give us an inheritance, a reward even greater than the pay that we receive from our employment. I ask you, Jesus, that you may help your people in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.